Coming to the immediate cause of the May 4th movement, uh, it can be said that uh, the immediate cause was the adverse attitude of the big powers and the mishandling of the Shantung question at the Versailles Peace Conference that was after the end of the First World War. Now, you know that large parts of China uh, were controlled by different foreign powers, capitalist powers, uh, and they uh, divided China into their own spheres of influence. Now, Shantung was a province which was under the control of Germany. Now, when Germany was defeated in the First World War, uh, Shantung was going to be handed over to Japan. So, Chinese demanded that there should be the end of all privileges, foreign privileges in China. The Shantung should be given back to China. They also demanded the abrogation of the 21 demands, which was placed by Japan in early 1915. Uh, by Hiroki Eki to the, to the then Chinese uh, president, Yuan Shikai. But the fact was that none of the demands of China were uh, addressed at the Versailles Peace Conference. And these were all turned down. And German privileges over Shantung were now handed over to Japan. It was this, there was a diplomatic failure for China in the Versailles Peace Conference. Uh, people of China became totally disillusioned after this uh, failure. And they came to realize that they, they would have to stand on their own feet to decide the destiny of their own country. It began definitely on a particular day, that is the May 4, in the year 1919. And it was on that day that 5,000 students of Peking they organized a mammoth demonstration in the city uh, against the verdict of the Versailles settlement on Shantung. And they also demanded a punishment of all those signatories to the 21 demands. As a result, a large number of students were arrested by the police. They were kept behind bars. So the students replied with a strike, a student strike. And that was on 3rd June. And the police also retaliated by arresting uh, another around three 300 students. And they put a ban on all patriotic movements in China. Now, despite this oppression, these repressive measures, uh, the movement spread to uh, new areas of the country. Now, meanwhile, thousands of telegrams had been uh, sent uh, to the Chinese delegation in Paris. The people called upon the delegates to withdraw from the Versailles Peace Conference. And in fact, the most uh, important of those telegrams was the one which was sent by the Society for China Salvation. It was a society, a uh, new society. And it the telegram read as follows. The whole nation is indignant over the failure of the Shantou question. Never sign the treaty. We demand your immediate withdrawal from the conference. Better to have forced occupation than voluntary submission. Otherwise, sole responsibility rests on you. That was the text of the full text of the telegram. After June 3, the first phase of the May 4th movement came to an end. That is from the 4th of May to the 3rd of June. That was the first phase of the May 4th movement when students or intellectuals, middle class people, they took an active part. Now, after 3rd June, we entered into the second phase of the movement. There was both a shift in the center of activity as also in the shift of the leadership in the struggle. The place shifted from Peking to Shanghai that is an industrial zone, the most important industrial zone. And the leadership was now taken over by the working class rather than the intellectuals or the students. And in fact, from 5th June to 11th June, about 70,000 workers of the textile and metal working industries 
and transport and public services in the city of Shanghai, they went on strike. And this strike also involved uh, workers in the Japanese owned mills, Japanese owned factories, textile mills and also in the US, British and French enterprises. And in fact, that was the first anti-imperialist movement of the working class in the history of Japan. Apart from the working class, the bourgeoisie, they also joined the movement. The bourgeoisie, the national bourgeoisie joined because as a result of the Mayfort movement, as a result of the boycott movement, there was scope for the development of national industries who were trying to stand up in the face of foreign capitalist onslaughts. And so Shanghai industries, uh, national industries, they also joined the movement. They suspended their business from uh, June 5. And this movement also shifted to other cities as well. From Shanghai, it also shifted to other cities. And so it became a countrywide city-based mass movement. It was an urban movement, but people from all walks of urban life, they joined in the movement. And so there was an united pressure uh, that ultimately forced the Chinese government to release all the arrested students. They were political prisoners. They were forced to release them. Uh, they were also forced to dismiss the officials and also forced the Chinese delegation to the Paris conference to refrain from signing the Versailles Treaty. Now, there is no doubt that the May 4th movement served as a conscious tool of history for an intellectual revolution that influenced the future course of Chinese history. There is no doubt about it. After the First World War, there were different strands of opinion among the Chinese intellectuals. There was one section which came to realize that Western capitalism would be no good for the Chinese people because the Holocaust of the First World War had proved that it was the system itself which was the cause of the war, of this great war. So that was one section who became totally disillusioned. There was another section which believed that we should still turn back to the past, to our Confucian past, to Confucian morality, etc. And there was another section which believed that the salvation lay in the path shown by the October Revolution. So the path of socialism, the path that was adopted by Lenin and other Soviet uh, leaders. And so debates had been going on among the Chinese intellectuals about the path that was most suitable for the Chinese people to attain their salvation. And it was, uh, the, it was all these movements, it was all these trends that propelled the May 4th movement, the intellectual revolution forward. Now, in the May 4th movement, foreign intellectuals played some part. We know that the Chinese intellectuals, there were many Chinese students who studied abroad. As for example, Hu Xi studied in the USA, and he was influenced by John Dewey, an American thinker. Now, John Dewey, came to China and he also gave some public lectures uh, on his political philosophy of pragmatism, ideas about education, uh, methods of thought, ethics, etc. And he believed in the transformation of ideas. It is an intellectual revolution. And you can see that Hu Xi was very much influenced by uh, Dewey's ideas. And to him, political revolution was a failure. And so we should look towards the intellectual field. So that was his idea. Uh, another Western thinker, of course, was Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell also uh, visited China, and he also gave public lectures. Now, Bertrand Russell was a pacifist, and he extolled the value of peace. He extolled the value of uh, pacifism the Pacific Chinese outlook on life, etc. But Russell's advice did not find much audience among the Chinese people because the situation was such that the Chinese people were very much patriotic. They were 
they were always eager to go for some action because they felt that they should not remain uh, peaceful. They should assert their authority. Hu Shi advocated an evolutionary theory which was called drop-by-drop drop development of Chinese society. That is evolutionary development. He did not believe in revolution. He believed in evolutionary development of Chinese society. On the other hand, Li Ta Chao or Chen Tu Xiu, they stood for an immediate and thoroughgoing socio-political transformation after the Soviet model, after the October Revolution, that is through revolutionary means. Hu Xi was very much critical of isms and cautioned against blind activism and what he called rather less revolution. That was Hu Xi's observation. Li Ta Chao, who himself introduced Marxism in China, on the other hand argued that isms were necessary to provide a common direction in solving social problems. So the conflict of ideas was very much evident uh, among the intellectuals. Now, Chao Se Sung, the historian of the uh, May 4th movement, uh, remarked that this movement was unique, both in the breadth of activity as also in the depth of significance. And he argued that that was the first time when the Chinese intellectuals recognized the need for the fundamental transformation of Chinese society. Now, before her contact with the Western world, uh, Chinese civilization had never been seriously challenged by any foreign ideology, except to some extent by Buddhism. Not by to a very great extent, but to some extent. But the Opium War had demonstrated the power of the West, and that was the first phase of the realization. The Opium War made Chinese people, Chinese intellectuals, realize that China had something to learn from Western science. And that stage continued till 1894-95, that is the Sino-Japanese War and the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki in 1895. Now, after 1895, the second phase or the second stage started. And in the second stage, uh, Chinese intellectuals felt that China should not only learn Western science, but they should also model her laws and political institutions after those of the West. And that continued till the beginning of the May 4th movement. And in the third stage, that is the stage which commenced from the May 4th movement, the intellectuals claimed that uh, China's philosophy and social theories should also be thoroughly re-examined in the light of Western experience. So that was the third stage. So there should not only be not only be a, uh, uh, not, th there should not be any partial renovation, but an attempt at the total dethronement of the old tradition of the basis of the old tradition heritage and that it should be replaced by a new culture and a new tradition and, and a new way of life. Sir, here I would like to ask you a question. So you said that uh, Hu Xi uh, believed in evolution drop by drop and uh, on the other hand we have Chao who believed in revolutionary uh, advancement and procedures. Which ideology was dominant in this May 4 movement or which uh, idea? Both of them were new intellectuals. Both of them were against old heritage, Confucian ethics and morality. But that this was a, a contradiction among, within the new intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, initially, uh, one cannot say at this stage, at the beginning, which was more imp which was uh, the dominant uh, thinking. But in course of time, definitely, more and more people felt that uh, the intellectual revolution should have to be 
uh, linked up with social political transformation. And that led to the birth of the Communist Party of China and people at one point of time started to uh, think that there should be a revolutionary transformation. Unless there was a basic change in society, one cannot think of uh, bringing about a fun, uh, basic changes in the uh, uh, livelihood of the people. So that came at a, not initially, that it cannot be at the initial, but because there are diff different schools of thought uh, which competed ideas, new ideas developed, so that can be said. One of the uh, main achievements of the Mayford movement was the publication of a large number of books and periodicals. And side by side, there was a rising tide of uh, iconoclasm, image breaking. Traditional thoughts and institutions were assailed, were attacked, as never before. And in fact, like what we find during the time of the French Revolution. Everything had to justify its existence before the judgment seat of reason or give up existence. And so the old, in this way, the old order uh, inlet plays to the new order, new thinking. Now, the most important achievement uh, probably took place in the ideological sphere. Uh, the new intellectuals, they, of course, uh, made Confucianism, Confucian ideology, their main target of attack. Because Confucianism was the ideology which had held the Chinese feudal society together for about 24 centuries, unlike any other country. And in fact, one of the main slogans of the Mayfort movement was down with Confucius and sons. Not only men, women, college girls, school girls, they took an active part in the Mayfort movement. And the first article criticizing Confucius by name appeared in 1916 in, the, in New Youth. And the author was Yi Pai Sha. And Yi Pai Sha said that Confucianism had no right to claim a monopoly over Chinese thought. Chen Tusi also uh, opposed the Confucian doctrines mainly on the grounds that it was a product of the feudal ages and so did not uh, fit the needs of a modern society. Modern society, according to Chen Tusi, was composed of individuals and not of clans or families. But Confucian ideology uh, was the ideology which uh, developed when clan system dominated. It was dependent upon the clans, independent upon the family system, which was not compatible with modern times. Another champion of anti-Confucianism was Wu Yu. And Wu Yu argued that, it's, that Confucian advocacy of paternalism had become the basis of despotism. And that is basic ethical principle, that is filial piety. It became the basis of unquestioning loyalty to the sovereign. And these new ideas also, side by side, attack the theories of rebirth, uh, ideas about the existence of ghosts, spiritualism, as well as divination, fortune telling, treatment of diseases by the use of charms, etc. All these were old ideas, we can call it medieval ideas, we can, we can call them ancient ideas, but these were also attacked during the time of the Mayfoot movement. That was the first important achievement. The second important ideological change was the adoption of the vernacular as the medium for writing. A new literature which was based on humanitarianism, based on romanticism and realism. And there was also the rapid development of the press and of popular education. Lu Sun, who was the most important figure of the Mayfort movement, intellectual of the Mayfort movement, he began his work as one of the pioneers of the new revolutionary democratic literature. He wrote short poems, and through those short poems, he assailed the existing feudal Chinese society. He himself was a fighter, and he has been acclaimed as the Maxim Gorky of China. He has also been compared to Voltaire of the French Revolution. Now, along with this, there was also a social transformation. The traditional family systems gradually declined. Traditionally, marriage was based on 
not on personal choice, but it was arranged. All marriages were arranged and there was no freedom of women, no freedom of girls. But it was during the Mayport movement that in the families, women, girls, they asserted, not only women, but youth, they fought against uh, patriarchy and they asserted their uh, independence, uh, their freedom in their own society. And cooperative arrangements were made, public nurseries were made, creches were made to free mothers from the burden Lenin described as the eternal drudgeries of housekeeping and childcare. So these were attempted, attempted during the May 4th movement. So the May 4th movement has also been described as a revolution in family. Economic structure also underwent changes. Uh, these were accompanied by the progressive decline of the landlord's position, unrest among the peasantry, uh, labor problem became very important, uh, political activities on the part of the urban dwellers became the order of the day. Side by side, the May 4th movement also influenced the political process in China. It hastened the unification of China, drawing people together both in thought as also in action. Uh, ideas like socialism, democracy, freedom, these became important, more and more welcomed. And ideas about warlordism, imperialism, colonialism, they were attacked, these were detested. Uh, one of the important achievements of the May 4th movement was the, birth of the, was the birth of the Communist Party of China in 1921. And a, a scholar, Lucien Bianco, uh, points out that May 4th movement was a ground clearing enterprise. It foreshadowed and paved the way for 1949 revolution as Voltaire had for uh, 17. 89. Now, while the achievements of the May 4th movements were numerous, the movement also suffered from some limitations. Chao Se Sung points out that uh, the leaders of the May 4th movement did not give Chinese tradition a fair measure of consideration. He argued that uh, many important features of Confucianism and national legacy were overlooked. And he also said that the reformers were also too impatient to do constructive work. Now, even while referring to these limitations, Chao Se Sung also admits that these limitations were perhaps unavoidable because it was a period of much intellectual turmoil, social turmoil. So uh, limitations, drawbacks are bound to be associated with such movement. It cannot be avoided in every movement there are drawbacks, there are limitations, there are shortcomings. So uh, May 4th movement can, cannot be an exception to it. It evoked a lot of controversy and there are two major schools of thought, one uh, represented by the liberals and other by the Marxists. The liberal view is represented by uh, Chen Tu Siu, Hu Xi and others and the Marxist view is represented among others by Mao Zedong. Now, the liberals hold that the May 4th movement was a Chinese renaissance, uh, which was somewhat similar to the European renaissance. They stressed that it was a movement of reason versus tradition. It was a movement of freedom versus authority. And that the movement also promoted a new literature in the living language of the people. Chao Se Sung, however, argues that the differences between the two renaissances were more numerous than resemblances. First of all, he says that Europe in the late Middle Ages uh, was a scene of a commercial revolution. There was a, tra there was a transformation in Europe. It was a transformation from feudalism to capitalism. And there was expansion of markets. There was a, a quest for colonies abroad. On the other hand, the Chinese economy was very much semi-colonial. It was not at all expensive, not to tell of this economy being uh, trying to go uh, spread its control abroad. The second part was that the European, in the case of the, the European Renaissance, was the substitution of uh, ancient Greco-Roman ideas for medieval ideas. So it was a, it was one sense going back to the past, distant past, 
rather than the medieval past in the case of Europe. But the Mayfort movement was not at all a restoration movement. It aimed at the a transplantation of the modern civilization uh, into an old nation, accompanied by a bitter criticism of the old culture, old civilization, down with Confucius and Sons. That was, uh, in fact, the spirit of the times. Uh, side by side, it is also true that in the case of the Chinese Renaissance, uh, there was the uh, adoption of vernacular as a national language, and there was also the establishment of a new literature. Now, that is a liberal view. The Marxist view has been represented by Mao Zedong. Now, Mao Zedong considered the May 4th movement as the jumping off point of the anti-imperialist and anti-feudal bourgeois democratic revolution leading to a new stage. Uh, to Mao, its attack against the old ethics, old Confucian ethics, and old literature was a main feature of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and which was unprecedented in the history of China. It was, according to Mao, it was a dividing line between old and new democracies. It took place again at the summons of the Russian Revolution. That is what he says. So it was very much influenced by the October Revolution and formed part of the World Proletarian Revolution. He added that it was, in a broad sense, it was an anti-imperialist united front composed of the Chinese workers, students, and the rising national bourgeoisie. Uh, we may end by saying that uh, the May 4th movement had a transitional character, no doubt about it. It was a uh, dividing line uh, in the intellectual, cultural, and uh, socio-political history of China, and it signaled the beginning of a uh, new era. So what we have discussed so far is the nature of the May 4th movement. It fought against uh, all Chinese traditions represented by Confucian ideas. It was influenced by Western ideas, no doubt. But it also uh, somehow uh, uh, made a maybe signification of Western ideas. There, was, there were Chinese elements modern Chinese elements and the Western elements, and they were more influenced by the socialist ideas because the, this May 4th movement definitely helped in the spread of revolutionary communist movement, the birth of the Communist Party of China in 1921 and the events that took place later. Mm -hmm.